All right, so today we're going to get started on some data recovery videos. Over the past five, six years, I've been trying to show you that you do not need to be a genius or have some ex very expensive fancy schmancy lab to get board repair done. And today I'd like to try and start shattering that myth that you need people wearing these astronaut suits and these multi-million dollar looking labs to get do hard drive data recovery. All you need is to be competent and have the basics down. And if you have that, you can recover some data. Well, and, unless you're, well, if you're Steve, not if you're me. So today we have this uh, Western Digital. Um, it came in clicking, so I'm actually going to go out here and show you guys what it sounds like. So that's what it sounds like. Um, what, this, what this drive does is it turns on, it clicks, and then it powers down. So, you know, really, it could only be one thing in this case, and it's usually heads. So, uh, yeah, let's open it up and take a look. So what type of bench is this that you're opening this in? This is a class 100 ISO 5. No, ISO 5 class 100, sorry. Um, it's pretty much the particle size that's allowed to, uh, you know, go in and stay in, so to speak. So some particles are just too small and you can't filter them out. And others, you know, you can. So I forget the numbers on this exactly, but it's a... Uh, ISO 5 class 100 all right so I'm just gonna take you guys uh, through what each component on the inside of the hard drive is I think you know it's a it's an important piece of this you know data recovery video so we'll start with the, um, the head stack assembly actually this so this thing here this is known as the head stack assembly this is what goes over the platters to read the data. You have the platters here. Um, you have the actuator magnet. The actuators, you know, underneath it. And uh, this is just, you know, the uh, the power for the, you know, head stack connected to here. Um, and that's that's pretty much it, really. PCB is on the other side of the hard drive. Right there. To replace the heads on this, it's pretty straightforward. Two screws here, this comes off. You obviously need the head comb to be in place first. And um, yeah, then the heads will, you know, the head stack assembly will come out and then you'll be able to, you know, uh, swap it. I'm gonna go into details a little bit more once I take this out, just to show you what, you know, what's what exactly. And um, yeah, let's get right into it. This little thing has a rubber. Sometimes the rubber is actually stuck on the housing here. It gets stuck on there. So <laughs> when you take out the donor to put into the patient, you can have double rubbers and it won't actually fit. You'll see that, you know, this thing is, um, you know, doesn't really fit, so to speak, but it does sit in there flush. Um, but yeah, that, that's a common thing that happens. Double rubbers sometimes allow you, you know, don't allow you to have the uh, head stack uh, to sit in there nicely. All right, so to remove the actuator magnet, what I use is a good pair of um, these pliers right here. I just literally stick it in there, pull up, and this comes off nicely just so. A lot of times what people say is you need to have the screw inside to hold the head stack assembly from moving. You don't really need to have that. Um, it's, it's, it is, it does help with the two and a half inch drives for sure. But for the three and a half inch, I found that it's, it's okay to actually have that removed and not have that in there. It, it doesn't make a big difference. Um, sometimes you want this little, you know, extra wiggle to not damage the heads that are parking in the ramp. So, uh, yeah, let's put the head comb in there. I should have actually put the head comb in there first, but it doesn't really hurt. All 
what this comb does is it keeps the heads separated. Now, why do you want the heads to be separated? You don't want the heads to touch. The heads in general um, are shielded. The read right heads are shielded from one another magnetically. So you don't want them to make contact with each other. But the majority of the time what happens is that when they do make contact, you separating them will cause the sliders to rip off. So, um, by the way, one, one key thing, the heads are actually on a slider, which I'll show you once I take this out. So now that the uh, stopper is out, this little guy here, this sits in there. Uh, the head, the head stack assembly can actually move around and um, be able to leave. This head stack assembly is not secured by a screw from the bottom, so you simply just pull this out, and it will, you know, uh, yeah, come out that way. There's no screws or anything like that. Um, a lot of times people use one of these um, it's to hold the drives in place and then allow you access underneath. Me personally, I found that it's easier to just maneuver the drive in my hand and not have to deal with, you know, tilting this backwards to have access to the, um, the drive itself. Uh, although this does organize things a little bit on, you know, in, in that regard, you don't have to, you know, worry about which one's the donor, which one's the patient. But, you know, it's all preference really at the end of the day. It doesn't change anything. So to take the heads, the head stack assembly out, you simply just use a, you know, I use a good pair of tweezers. Uh, they're, they have, a, you know, some teeth, so it helps with the grip. And I go right into... The heads themselves have this thing sticking out. So you can actually use that to grab it and pull it out. So I use that and the corner of the uh, head stack to actually pull it out. Just wiggle it out like so, and then you'll see you'll be able to grab it, and you'll be able to just pull it out. These here are the sliders. Maybe I'll I'll put a uh, microscope uh, picture of this, and that way you'll have a up close view of what the what they what they look like. So these black dots here essentially are the sliders. Now on the sliders are where the heads rest, and. Um, you know, the read-write heads is what grabs the data off of the platters. And, uh, that, yeah, that's how it reads your data. It is magic words to make the camera focus, is it not? <laughs> Abraca focus? That's not it. Focus, you fuck. That's Pretty close. It. So, uh, let's just uh, dust this thing out. By the way, I use compressed air for uh, dusting these hard drive uh, hard drives out, and I also have this guy here. Sometimes you need a little bit of uh, a you know velocity in the air to you know, just get rid of the stubborn particles and whatnot that you don't want to touch the platters with, like let's say a Q-tip or something like that, which you could, by the way. But you, you want a little bit more power from you know uh, the air like let's say the air can has uh, you know decent amount of power uh, or force um, on you know with the air to actually get it out one important thing by the way is the typical um, damage to hard drives so this is the head stack assembly right here there are a couple of ways that the hard drives usually get damaged the first is if you have the drive off right and the head stack is in the park position which is let me just put this back in here which is on this ramp by the way so this ramp oh, too much so this ramp here is what houses or stores these sliders when the drive is off so let's say the drive is off normally this parks you know like so two things usually happen 
or two different you know situations usually happen when when it comes to hard drive damage or you know uh, heads damage you have this hard drive that's off currently like this you drop it let's say you have it you know in your bag or something like that and what normally happens is if it's a strong enough drop the head stack assembly will actually move onto the platter so it will get stuck onto the platters now you can do two things from there you can watch a YouTube video and put a screwdriver in here and literally turn this counterclockwise while moving this at the same time damaging the heads on the slider or you can get a tool to remove the stuck heads from the platter carefully now the, I mean don't get me wrong the it does work where you just simply rotate this platter backwards like so and then carefully slide out the heads but there's a good chance that you're gonna damage the sliders themselves when you're doing that so and I've seen that all the time actually just you know I saw a case today where that that was you know that, that's what happened the guy tried to fix it himself the heads were stuck they were not damaged they were just stuck because the drive was dropped and that's what he did he tried to do it himself and then he he damaged the sliders and of course he powered it on and then when he powered it on it caused even more damage so back to the different type of damages so that's the first one where you have the drive off the drive falls this head stack assembly goes on to the platters and it gets stuck there now when it gets stuck there two things can happen if you notice that you dropped it the best thing you can do is not power it back on why is that because when you do power it back on this motor or this spindle here sometimes is stronger than the sliders and the, then the force that the slider is actually putting on the, the platter so what that means is that when this spins and the head stack is on the platters it's going to rip the sliders off right away in the two and a half inch drives when the head stack is on the platters and you power it on it actually beeps now it beeps because the platter itself or the motor spindle in this case cannot spin it can't spin because it's being held down by the head stack assembly itself so the head stack assembly and the two and a half inch drives actually pre prevents the spindle from spinning and when it doesn't allow it to spin that's actually good because then you don't have this you know case where the sliders get ripped off the head stack itself the second type of damage in this case is when the heads just go out this drive that I'm working on here might have had a power surge because it came in with a bad PCB as well and it wasn't the dies or anything like that it was you know something related to the PCB itself that I just couldn't you know figure out so I just decided to swap it which is you know it saves a lot of time that way instead of having to figure out oh you know is this a diode is this you know a bad resistor or something like that it's always easier to if it's not the diode to simply swap the PCB if you have it handy and we have you know most of these things handy so this specific drive came in with that issue so it was not powering on and when it did power on you heard that clicking sound that we just showed you guys earlier that's the second type of damage where I would assume that that's what happened somehow the preamp in the head stack assembly by the way which is um, can't see it but it's uh, right there got fried or damaged that's one possible situation but it's really difficult to pinpoint what caused it to fail this specific case well now there's a third option now that I bring this one up there's a third option the third option is when the drive is on this platter is spinning and the head stack is above the platter so the head stack is resting right there over the platter and it's grabbing it's reading the data from it and then you drop it what happens right then and there is that the sliders they're gonna smash into the platter with and then that that's gonna cause you know all sorts of platter damage and whatnot some drives do survive that and then a lot of the Seagate drives don't. Western Digitals, like this one here, do survive it. But, you know, each drive is different. Each year and make of the drive is different from really any, any company. 
so let's go ahead and uh, take this this guy out. What type of drive do you store your personal data on? I store my data on Seagate? Western Digital, actually. Do you have any personal data stored on a Seagate? I do not. I do not own a Seagate drive. Do any of your family members own a Seagate drive? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so there are three different um, hard drive manufacturers. You have Toshiba, Western Digital, and Seagate. Any drive that you get nowadays is one of these three. It doesn't really matter, you know, where you buy it from. It's always going to be one of these three. Of course, if it's recent. So this one here happens to be a uh, Western Digital, and uh, Western Digital in general is the more, uh, I would say, established company in my eyes. They have about you know three times the, uh, the the sales volume of Seagate, two to three times, somewhere around there. All right. So taking this out. We're gonna open the donor, take the head stack assembly from the donor, put it in the patient, and um, let's see what happens. So this is an actual case that I was, you know, going through, and um, this is literally step by step what happened. Um, so this goes to show. You'll see later on in the video. This goes to show that there are, you know, certain problems that you're gonna probably run into, and. Uh, this is actually one of them. So let's put this aside. So if you notice, this one says two terabytes. And whereas the donor says one terabyte. That doesn't really matter. Um, it's, it's not a big deal. As long as the heads are the same and the preamps, or let's say micro jocks in this case actually, uh, match. So the micro jocks are. Um, a set of parameters for the hard drive head stack assembly and it it's uh, you can think of it's fine-tuned to work with what's set up on this hard drive it's a bit difficult to explain what micro jogs are it's, it's you can think of it as a as a set of parameters for that specific head stack assembly when it's manufactured that's the best definition for that All right, so this is the donor here. There's really a lot to explain. I can't fit it all in one video. It's um, maybe I'll make a uh, I don't know, another video with just introduction to you know what you need to match stuff like that and what is you know what's why do you need to match a preamp and stuff like that. But for 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 the most part, this video is just going to be a, a normal procedure of a head stack. Assembly replacement. So, just like the other one, this one has two screws here and this actua ma actuator magnet, which is <laughs> rather difficult to remove. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put the head comb in this time. So sometimes, depending on the quality of the tools that you have, sometimes this little pin here that goes in there to secure the head, uh, the um, the head comb in there, it's a bit, it's a bit uh, finicky. You can't really get it in there. So what I tend to do is I tend to move the head comb itself and then let that fall in just like that. I don't know if you saw that, but it, it it's in. <laughs> so yeah, that's in there now. We're going to go ahead and do the same thing. We just get these two screws out. Is there a manual focus button on that camera? I don't think I so. Find that Maybe on the other side. It's, it's annoying, but that's fine. Uh, this comes out like the other one did, just like that. And um, what I, like, I like to move the drives a lot when I'm working with them. You know, some people might say that's a bad thing. It's not, you know, something you should do. But it's again preference, and as long as you're careful, you should be fine. So again, to remove this actuator magnet, you I use, you know, a pair of pliers, and um, I found that that works the best. Some people use a magnet to remove this, like a specific, you know, specially made magnet that attaches to this and just comes right off. Uh, you don't need you don't really need that. You just go in here, 
you you know you dig through there and then you just use some force to get this guy out just like that now we can uh, remove the stopper so this little guy here it prevents the head stack assembly from leaving the ramp so if you see I'm, if I'm trying to push this way this direction it won't allow me to because it's there now if I just simply move it back and pull it out and then you'll see that this will come right off pretty clever design and uh, it, it really does work it's just a piece of rubber and um, yeah it's just attached to this uh, small piece of metal and that's it so again to get this out you just wiggle it through here and then you grab it right there Sometimes they, they are a bit difficult to get out. Um, you just keeping it, keep moving it back and forth to the left, right, left, right, and then you'll see that it'll slide out just fine uh, on this model. So you don't have anything to worry about. All right, so uh, we're gonna take, this is the donor head stack assembly, and we're gonna install it in the patient. This is our patient. When I put this back in, you want to be careful not to drop it or even drop it on the platters. You know, that will surely ruin, you know, the, the top ladder and give you a lot of uh, unnecessary uh, <laughs> trouble, so to speak. So I like to grab it from this angle and then I grab it with these two uh, fingers as well. So my index and my uh, thumb. <clears throat> And I just simply slide it in there, like so. And again, I, I want to make sure that there are no dual rubbers in here. So there's only one. This is, this is the rubber I'm talking about. You probably can't see it, but uh, sometimes it gets stuck in there. All right. You can see how this one moves. It sort of uh, wiggles left and right. That's okay, it's not, it's not a big deal. Once you have the cover on and then the screw in there, I'll show you quickly. Uh, grab the heads. See, so it's nice in there and it does not move anymore. So it just moves um, this way or this way, which is all the movement that it should make. So I'm going to go ahead and slide that back in here. Again, for some people, this screw is put back in there to make things easier. For me, it doesn't really change much. On the two and a half inch though, it is necessary. So on the three and a half inch, it's not, and you can make do with it, but it's a good habit to practice. You, you don't want to cause any damage or anything like that to the head uh, stack assembly, the donor head stack assembly when you're putting, putting it back in there. So. Um, you're gonna slide the pin out, you know, get this guy out, and just lift up. So now, what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that this is free to move. The, heads, the, the new donor headstock assembly is free to move. So, in this case it is. The heads are not stuck in any way. Uh, of course, don't push it too far up this way because then you will cause the sliders to stick to the platters. You don't want that. Uh, let me go ahead and remove the screw. I'm gonna go ahead and put these two screws in here. Now, putting the actuator magnet back on. This is one of the trickier parts to do in, in the whole, you know, uh, stack uh, assembly replacement. I like to simply just hold it between my thumb and my uh, index and gently let it into that right, or in this case, left corner. And then hold this end here and then just drop it like that. It'll stick right in place. You won't cause any damage. And again, you want to make sure that this is free to move. Um, looks like it is. 
there's nothing stuck or anything keeping it from moving. This is for the most part good to go. I'm gonna take the drive, just give it a little bit of uh, air. Give the bottom cover some air, or the top cover. Check for any debris on the platters. All right, looks good now. Put it back on. All right, like so. You just put the screws back on in this case. Uh, I like to do the diagonal method. Um, one screw here, 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 so that it's spread out nicely. You don't want to bend the cover, you don't want to make it lopsided or anything like that. Alright, so that completes that. This drive is uh, ready to be plugged into PC3000 and let's see what it tells us. So, before this drive is making clicking noises, I went ahead and replaced the head stack assembly. It should not be making any clicking noises. And let's see what it does in PC3000. So it starts up, you get a busy, the busy green light on. Just give it a second. Still busy. There you go. It became ready. So uh, let's let's just hit the auto detect button here. Load it up. So what do you know? We get we get an ID. We get that it's a one terabyte, which is what it was, it was a one terabyte. We get that it's a Western Digital. We knew that already. We get that, you know, a clear reading on the firmware. You're gonna hit auto detect. Then you're gonna hit utility start. And as you can see here, it loads all of the service area, the ROM, it, seemingly fine, but you'll see that it's not really okay. Let's uh, let's quickly access. Um, well, what I like to do is I like to check the uh, the modules directory right after the headstack assembly replacement. Uh, the first thing you should do after the headstack, by the way, is to make a backup of the resources. Um, that's it's a very important process that shouldn't be skipped. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, do that. I've already made it, so I'm not going to actually uh, you know uh, show you here. I'm just going to go to the uh, modules directory and normally it tells you when you're backing it up that this module is good, this module is bad, but we can go ahead and check it just for the, uh, the sake of you know this video, why not? So as you can see, everything shows that it is reading okay for the most part. Once this is done, I'm going to show you a little bit more about this and the critical level. So once you sort it by the critical modules, you'll see that, let's see, the first, especially the first four, these are the most important. Encryption keys is if it's encrypted. A lot of the time you get a drive that is encrypted after, let's say, you swap the BIOS or something like that. So, something similar to that, where you swap the PCB from USB to SATA. Let's say so that that's uh, that's one um, one important module here. It's the encryption for let's say when you do a USB PCB to SATA, uh, you run into encryption, and you know you have to make sure that the encryption key is there, which is usually stored on a chip on the PCB itself, so you can read it right off there. It's a great security by uh, Western Digital. The translator, think of it as a micro program. It's a program that translates logical block addressing or you know, let's say LBA0 to the, to the physical part of the, the disk. So I'll probably make another video about that. It's again, it's a, whole, it's a whole separate video that you can make on some of these firmware issues and whatnot. But basically put, uh, the translator converts LBA to PBA, so, and vice versa. So a lot of times when you have issues with the translator, you can't read the last sector. That's just one of the many problems that you get. So anyway, onto, onto, onto this drive. So we're gonna go here, heads test. We're gonna select all of these. 
no more than a minute and let's see what what it tells us so I've selected heads by the way this drive has six heads uh, zero to it doesn't really matter the numbers zero one two and then five six seven it skips four and three but it doesn't really matter currently here it's testing head zero and head zero you saw the uh, the error register light up there clearly there's something wrong with head zero on this so it's a bit strange there you go see it gave, gave you an error right there it's a bit strange because head zero was working at some point in the donor and it looks like some something whether it, I'm not sure really what went wrong here but again this was a live case and um, that's exactly what happened so and it drove me nuts because ironically head zero was not, was checking out so what I did was I did not wait for the entire um, did it work before head recording and not work after recording and I just skipped did it work Once before recording and then not work after recording and, and two were okay so <laughs> it's not showing it now but head number five was bad and then also seven and I'm not sure if it'll do it now I'm, I'm gonna let it run let's see if it does and um, yeah we'll go from there all right so as as you can see clearly head number two is wrong it has errors something is up with it and I think head number five for the most part now is is okay for some reason but that was not the case so this is hysterical. The point this is what happens is to me every single day when I hit start streaming. Head zero, head, head zero bad, but it will ID correctly. So <laughs> head number one is okay in this case. Head number two has errors. Head number five is okay. Yeah. Let's see if I disable head, I don't know, uh, two. Maybe that's the culprit. Because head zero, we don't really um, want to disable. You, you, you can't disable it, so to speak. Um, it's, you know, head zero and one. Or what what's used to access the service area so but you'll see with head six you'll quickly run into issues there as you see right here so what this tells us in this case is that head six is causing this drive to not have access to sector zero uh, and, and to the data at all um, and what this in turn means is I need to put a new set of heads in there so let's load this, uh, let's stop this test for example here. Let's go into here and we're going to edit the ROM. Uh, let's do this here. ROM head map editing. Derp. There you go. All right, so we're going to go ahead and disable head number six and head number two. And let's see if that gives us access to sector zero. We're going to hit yes. It's going to save the ROM and then write the ROM back to the PCB let's wait for it and then I'm gonna repower this drive you see it's stuck and busy we should it should post to the no it turned off okay interesting all right so it's not IDing at all with this uh, with this configuration so let's write the ROM the original ROM back and um, Let's see, so this was let me see Z9696. Yeah, so we're gonna choose this guy here, do data, auto backup ROM. And I'll uh, hit that. All right, so let's repower it now and see if this drive IDs correctly. And there you go, IDs correctly. I'm gonna refresh this here. And that is, let's see. Okay, it is not getting ID'd correctly. All right, let's write, hmm, interesting why that happened. Let's see what the ROM here says. Two, six. So same. <laughs> All right, so let's see if we can get a good idea on it. No. Okay, interesting. 
let's see why it's in kernel mode. Maybe I shifted the service area regions. And what do you know? I did. So let's quickly go to uh, the regions editor. Now let's allow SA access. I'm going to hit OK. All right. Now we're going to power it down. Exit utility. There you go. Ready? Now it should ID correctly. And bam, bam. All right. So what this tells us is that you can have the drive ID perfectly fine, perfect access to the modules, perfect access to the service area, but no data access. And this is the case here. So in this case, what was happening was I was able to disable previously, I was able to disable the head heads uh, two and six and then I, I would get access to the data that way and it would work regardless I still need heads number two and six to work so I will have to get another donor and put the heads in there and um, hopefully it'll give us access fully to the data all right so clearly that head stack for whatever reason worked in the donor gave me access to the first sector LBA zero but in our patient it was not working for some reason so what could what, what what happens in this case is you 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 would think that it's not related to the heads Steve is experiencing what I experience on stream on a daily basis it works off camera and it fucks up when you start streaming poor guy but it is related to the heads and a quick way to test that is by just doing the heads test or uh, and actually waiting for it to complete, which, is, which was my mistake. I did not wait for the heads test to finish. And then you'll see that head number six is bad, for example. So the point here is that you have to wait for the heads test to complete in general. And uh, then it'll give you a better idea of what's going on. So uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get the HUD comb in this again. You can skip this, this is boring. All right, so we have the drive plugged into PC3000 now. And uh, yeah, let's see if it works. I'm gonna go ahead and exit from here. So we get the busy status register. Normally it takes about five, five to 10 seconds for it to, to go to get ready and uh, you'll be able to access it. There you go, so you hit auto, uh, like that, you're going to select it in normal, all right, so, so now, the moment of truth, and let's see if we have access to the data, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, load up sector edit, you know, view LBA0, and what do you know, it is giving us access now. Now, if you look at this here, this is garbled up data that doesn't really look like what it should be, especially in, a, in you know, the MBR or LBA0, what it's supposed to look like. So this is clearly encrypted, and you can tell by, you know, just going around and seeing, you know, these, uh, this pattern here where there's, you know, it almost looks the same, so to speak. So clearly this is encrypted, and this is where the... In decryption model comes in so we're going to go to sector edit again, again uh, sector edit and then we're going to hit this little button here and then we're going to decrypt and then we're going to auto detect and then it found it that's the encryption we're going to hit it and then you'll see this there you go so it it cleared it up so that you actually see what lba zero looks like and you know this is clearly a windows or ntfs format drive pay Yes. So now we're going to run a we're going to run a uh, we're going to build a heads map. What a head ma heads map does is it correlates each head to each LBA on the drive itself. 
So you know, I'll show you, it's gonna be easier to explain. So head zero, for example, was from zero until like 50,000. Now head two is from 50,000 till about 40, about 40,000 LBAs on each head. Um, now this tells us that head, head number three has some issues on it. It is not as fluid as it should be, but you can simply disable it. You just hit that button to disable it, and then there you go. You're copying at a uh, you know 70 megs a second. Um, so this wraps it up. Um, I hope you guys learned something, and perhaps in the future we'll do more videos. It's just it's been quite busy lately, so I haven't really had time for these videos. And uh, Lewis back there is. Uh, <laughs> He's, he's been on my case for uh, quite a while to, to get these done. But yeah, as always, hope you learned something and uh, have a good one.